Welcome to part four of my Nintendo Torn Down series. In parts one, two, and three, we took a look at the internal components of the Japanese Famicom, the U.S. Nintendo Entertainment System, the redesigns of both of those systems, the Japanese Super Famicom, and the U.S. Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Now in part four, we're going to take a look at uh, the internal components of the redesigns of the Super Famicom and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Just like the Famicom AV redesign in Japan, the Super Famicom redesign got a new name. It's called the Super Famicom Junior, mainly because it was a smaller version of the original hardware. Just like the redesigned Nintendo Entertainment System, the redesigned Super Nintendo Entertainment System did not get a new name. It was just the newer version of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And both of these consoles uh, are a lot smaller than their original counterparts. They also lack the eject mechanism that those, uh, those pieces of hardware had. Unlike the NES redesigns, the internal components of these two systems are just about identical. There isn't going to be too much of a difference at all. Just like the original Super Famicom and Super Nintendo Entertainment System that we already took a look at, once you removed their shells, the internal components were pretty much the same deal. The biggest differences here are the shells. Take a look at the cartridge slots. These are meant to accommodate uh, Super Famicom cartridges, and these are meant to accommodate uh, US NTSC Super Nintendo Entertainment System cartridges. Take a look at the back of each system. They both have the same multi-AV output for stereo AV cables, composite only, S-Video and RGB will not work. They also have their region's uh, specific AC adapter input right here. In order to get into one of these redesigned Super Nintendo Entertainment Systems or Super Famicoms, you are going to need a game bit and like all other uh, Nintendo systems that use security screws on the outside, you're going to need your larger 4.5 millimeter game bit. And there are four security screws holding the system together at each of the four corners. Once you get the screws out, which I've already done, I recommend flipping the system right side up because the internal components are secured to the bottom chassis, not the top. So if we lift off, and lift off. Lo and behold, we have pretty much the exact same system. And it's interesting to note here that with the Famicom and the NES, as well as the redesigns for both of those systems, it was the US version of the NES that typically had the RF shielding. Here, both units have the RF shielding, both on the top and I believe on the bottom. We're going to take a look at that to confirm in a moment. In order to get the uh, shielding off and to uh, remove the motherboard from the bottom chassis, you're going to have to remove a couple of standard Phillips screws. If I count here, I believe that I see one screw hidden here. That's for the multi-AV out. Two silver screws on either side of the cartridge slot. And then one, two, three, four four copper colored standard Phillips screws. So four plus two, seven. You got seven total screws that we need to remove. So I'm gonna get busy doing that. All right, so removing each of those seven screws not only uh, makes it so that you can remove the RF shielding, but it also frees the motherboard from the bottom chassis. And again, you're going to want to make sure that you pay attention to the three longer silver screws that you removed. Two of them, as always, were on either side of the cartridge slot right here. And the third one was this screw hidden in the hole that uh, mounts the, uh, the AV out connector to the chassis. So first, let's take a look at the board underneath the RF shield. The RF shield has some little tabs on it right here and these tabs fit into these little slots right below the, uh, the cartridge input. And it's the exact same deal for the US redesigned Super Nintendo Entertainment System. When we take a look here, 
they appear to be identical. Same number of chips, both read 1997 Nintendo CP uh, SNN CPU 01. And if we lift the motherboard out of the system here, I am surprised to see that there is no bottom RF shielding. So I don't know what determines whether RF shielding needs to be used on the top, bottom, or both, but evidently here it needs to be only on the top. So if we take a look at these systems side by side and think back to the bulk and the amount of plastic and screws that were used in their original counterparts, it's amazing to see how these systems can be streamlined in just a matter of a couple of years. I mean, from 1990 to 1997, I know seven years is quite a bit of time when you're talking about electronics, but just to start contrast to the simplicity of this redesign versus the original is uh, pretty staggering. It's interesting to see. I really do like this system. Uh, the only unfortunate part about it, and I've already mentioned this in my uh, Connecting Your Nintendo Console series, is that uh, this system, as it was manufactured, is incapable of outputting an S video signal. And uh, it can't do an RGB or component signal either. Super Nintendos, even the originals, had to be modified to output an RGB signal. But the originals even were capable of doing S-Video. These, how, however, are not. From what I understand, all the components are there. It's just a matter of connecting some traces on the board here. I'm not exactly sure uh, where those traces are. But if we take a look... You can see right here the AV out with the power, and there's a bunch of capacitors uh, underneath a heat sink here. So I imagine that whatever needs to be connected for S-Video is somewhere in this region of the board right here. Alright, so that concludes part four of the Nintendo Torn Down series. We're going to get into Nintendo's uh, more modern consoles. Part 5, we're going to be taking a look at the Nintendo 64. And then in Part 6, the final part, we'll be taking a look at the GameCube.